Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be tackling a pretty interesting and a somewhat intriguing question that was recently asked in one of the studies you can find in the description below. Can a planet have its own mind? Can a planet be conscious? And though it's not a question that's going to be very easy to answer, it is nevertheless an extremely important question for the reasons raised in this particular paper. But because this is such a complex topic, we do have quite a lot to cover here. And I guess the first thing I wanted to talk about is the idea of mind itself. First of all, we still have no idea what intelligence, consciousness, or the idea of having a mind even is. In other words, self-awareness is not really that well defined. But for this particular paper, we're going to stick to one definition. It's the idea behind self-awareness having an ability to somehow self-maintain. So, for example, when you're hungry, your body finds a way to get you more food. When you're thirsty, it finds you more water. If something is not functioning well, it finds a way to try to fix it. So this self-maintaining is going to be sort of the basis for the principle of a planet having a mind. And that's because the idea of self-awareness is a very, very complex topic. And I'm only going to cover just a tiny part of this because there's going to be a future video discussing this in more detail. Actually, if you'd like to learn more about this, I'm leaving some of the links in the description, but one of the most common ways of testing if, for example, an animal is self-aware is what's known as a mirror test. And just as the name implies, it's a test involving a mirror. Pretty easy test to try at home if you have a pet or something. I actually tried this with my dog and unfortunately he failed. And the way it works is really simple. Let's just say we're talking about this baboon right here. You place a tiny visible dot somewhere on its face or maybe somewhere on its body and then let this baboon interact with a mirror. If they start acting like this is another animal, the animal failed the test. However, if they realize that not only is that this is them, but they also start to look at the dot and try to remove it by essentially looking at the mirror itself, this would imply that the animal or whatever you're testing is self-aware after all. Here's actually a really good example of an actual test conducted with magpies, and we know that they are self-aware because they constantly try to remove a dot no matter what species of magpies this is tested on. So in this particular case, this is a self-aware species. Same has been done with several types of dolphins, whales, and a lot of different primates, and they also seem to be self-aware as well. But some animals, like for example dogs, tend to be somewhat self-aware. Some dogs pass the test, some don't. Actually, most dogs seem to not pass it, mostly because dogs are just not visual creatures. They tend to use their noses more, and they do pass the nose self-awareness test. Actually, there is an experiment that tested that as well. And so, if you do have a pet at home, try it out for fun to see if your pet is also self-aware. But even this process, in terms of the actual brain function, is still poorly understood. There are certain brain parts that have been identified that seem to be responsible for self-awareness in us, in humans, but we're still really far from being able to exactly pinpoint where all of this is happening. More about this in one of the future videos. And that's because today we really want to talk about planets. Can a planet be self-aware? And the way that this argument starts is with the idea of the biosphere with this beautiful image from NASA making a pretty good visual analogy. In some sense, biosphere could be seen as something that is alive. As a matter of fact, the so-called Gaia hypothesis that was proposed a few decades ago does kind of explore this in more detail, but most scientists today don't really think biosphere is alive like a typical organism, but they do think that the biosphere is a kind of a metaphor for an actual living being. Because here, depending on the conditions, everything sort of self-regulates. We have different organisms interacting with inorganic surroundings on the planet, and through these complex interactions of different types of organisms on the planet, the biosphere itself creates the ultimate conditions for life to stay on the planet for billions of years. And there are so many different analogies about how this works that can be visible pretty much everywhere. For example, at some point, plants started to produce oxygen by using photosynthesis. This then created a lot of other conditions necessary for other life to thrive. And over time it created different, really large communities such as, for example, forests, where everything becomes self-regulated. So in this case, we know that different types of forests can actually regulate everything in the forest by using the very extensive root system. So let's just say one of the trees somewhere is starving or needs a lot of nutrients, the entire system is actually going to send required nutrients to that particular tree. 
And these types of self-regulations and these types of activities where a lot of organisms sort of collaborate and cooperate is extremely widespread on our planet. And that's the idea behind Biosphere. It's a creation of a kind of a self-maintaining system by the activity of all sorts of life on the planet. Something that naturally existed here for at least three and a half billion years. But then we have this new introduction, us, and we tend to do our own thing. And specifically, we started to introduce a lot of other things that are slowly throwing the biosphere a little bit out of balance. So yes, there is pollution, there are a lot of other influences we create on the planet that tend to sort of change things. But in this case, it could be not a bad thing at all. As a matter of fact, this is kind of what the scientists in this paper are implying. They're implying that this is part of the evolution of the planetary system. And there's a next stage after this. So what exactly is this paper about? So first of all, the scientists in this paper suggest that there are four stages for all planets before they reach their ultimate stage. The most common stage for pretty much all planets we've discovered so far is the so-called immature biosphere. Something that was probably around on early Earth billions of years ago with maybe just a little bit of microbes and bacteria on the surface, possibly some activity that could be detectable in the atmosphere, such as the production of CO2 and methane, but practically no self-regulation and no feedback of any kind. Stuff here exists, it does its own thing, but nothing is affected on the planet. And then suddenly we reach the second stage, the mature biosphere. And this is the Earth between about 2.5 billion years ago and approximately 540 million years ago. We suddenly have vegetation, we have photosynthesis, we have a lot of oxygen being circulated on the planet, suddenly we have things like ozone layer, and the biosphere becomes active and starts to maintain the habitability of the planet. Now this is something we are hoping to find somewhere out there. Chances are we might be able to find this if this is a common activity. And in this case you're going to start seeing some other gases like for example oxygen. And then we have the current stage, the immature technosphere. We now have at least one species on the planet producing stuff that produces other stuff. And that species on the surface found a way to essentially use resources from the biosphere and from possibly the planet itself to create its own way to communicate, to transport things, to produce all sorts of different materials, but during that stage, because this is a completely new thing to the planet, it sort of throws it off balance and starts to introduce new materials. In this example we have the so-called CFCs, the materials that we often associate with the ozone hole or with being extremely powerful greenhouse gases, with some other gases also changing their balance in the system. But the problem in this case, and the reason why it's called immature technosphere, is because it's not integrated in the biosphere itself, it's not integrated in the self-maintenance of the system. It adds a lot of new things, but a lot of those new things are either not doing anything or are actually making things a little bit worse, but more importantly, it's not regulated and it's not regulated by the biosphere. And so in some sense, this actually starts working against the other parts of the biosphere. And that's unfortunately where we are right now. But then there's the next stage that the scientists propose and the stage we should be aiming at. And as you can probably imagine, they refer to this as mature technosphere. The ultimate aim for the biosphere and for any technologically active species living on the planet. All of the systems in place, including all of the technology, is now somehow benefiting the entire planet. With all of the energy extracted from the planet, not really harming anything and actually balancing out with everything else. But more importantly, in this particular case, this technosphere now also becomes part of the biosphere. It actually starts to sort of cooperate and enhance it even more. And it is precisely at this stage that the scientists behind this paper are making an assumption that the planet becomes sort of self-aware. Well, not self-aware like we are, but basically it's able to self-maintain. It sort of acquires a mind of its own with all of the technological emissions being balanced out by other parts of the technosphere itself, with the entire technosphere working for the benefits of the planet and thus allowing the planet to exist for billions of years more. Naturally, not something we're doing right now just yet. As a matter of fact, one of the more brilliant quotes from the paper is that, well, there is definitely intelligence on the planet, but the planet itself right now is not intelligent yet. The planet does not have planetary intelligence, it doesn't have its own mind. 
But here the implication is that, well, maybe somewhere out there, we might actually already see certain planets that potentially possess this mature technosphere where the entire system is integrated into the biosphere and everything is able to self-regulate. And by having a complex system with a lot of interaction on the inside, this is when we start seeing a lot of different emerging properties. And in some sense, that's exactly what happens in our brains. All of these different connections between neurons start to create us. They create the intelligence. And so in this case, the scientists believe that, well, maybe something like this can potentially happen to a planet where intelligent species develops this particular technosphere. The next evolutionary stage of a typical planet. And so just like a biosphere that was able to maintain the planet for billions of years, the next stage technosphere can make it even better. Although I guess one question that's going to be very difficult to answer in this case is, okay, but how do we actually get there? And how would that look like if we were to look for this using telescopes? None of those questions are currently answerable, but it is definitely something we have to try to figure out. I mean, more or less for the existence of our own species. And so one of the main purposes behind this research is to really try to figure out where exactly should we be headed? What should we be doing in order to preserve the technosphere and to make it into something that to some extent acquires its own mind? With the other implication, potentially also answering the so-called Fermi paradox. If we ever find some kind of a technological civilization out there, it's probably because they found a way to reach the stage. They didn't kill themselves, reaching an actual stage of planetary intelligence. And if we'd like to survive as well, for as long as possible, we definitely have to try to use our own intelligence for the benefit of the planet as a whole. But I guess baby steps. So pretty intriguing research, very interesting study, but something we'll discuss more in some of the future videos as well. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.